Let's look at a few more examples of reactions of organolithiums and Grignard reagents with carbonyl compounds to get a feel for these reagents. The first reaction I want to look at involves the combination of either an organolithium, RLI, or a Grignard reagent, RMGX, where X is chlorine or bromine, with an ester. The product we get from this reaction looks interesting. We get two additions of the organolithium, in this case, to the carbonyl group, and somehow the ethoxy group within the ester has disappeared. What seems to have happened is a double addition type of process, or a substitution followed by addition process. And we'll see that the structure of the ester enables this reactivity. Before we dig into the mechanism, notice that this is a nice way to form either secondary or tertiary alcohols. If we start with a formal ester where H is linked to the carbonyl carbon, we can end up with a secondary alcohol. Typical though is the formation of a tertiary alcohol in which two groups linked to the alcohol carbon are the same via this double reaction process. So let's begin by looking at this mechanism. And I'm going to keep it fairly general here by burying the CH2PH group as R but we're gonna keep the ethoxy group there because we wanna follow what happens to it to figure out where it went. pH-LI is really pH minus Li plus, and you may have figured out by now that the Li plus is essentially a spectator ion in all of these reactions, so it's typically okay to leave it out when you're drawing mechanisms. The first step, as is typical for the reaction of an organolithium with a carbonyl compound, is nucleophilic addition to the polarized CO pi bond. This results in the formation of a tetrahedral intermediate. And within this tetrahedral intermediate, we have a good electron source in the form of the anionic or alkoxide oxygen, and we have a group that has the potential to act as a leaving group, the OET or ethoxy group. What can happen now is beta elimination. And the product of this step is a ketone in which one of the carbon groups linked to the carbonyl carbon is derived from the organolithium. Really quick, I want to pause here to note something. In essence, what we've done in these first two elementary steps, nucleophilic addition followed by beta elimination, is a net substitution of the nucleophilic phenyl group for OET. We've done a nucleophilic acyl substitution. In fact, we saw similar reactivity in the reactions of esters with complex metal hydrides, lithium aluminum hydride specifically. That substitution has generated a ketone but as we saw in the previous video, this ketone is highly reactive toward carbon ions. And so another equivalent of phenyl anion can enter the picture now and participate in a second round of nucleophilic addition now to the ketone carbonyl carbon. Backing up just a little bit, in the previous step, we can see what happened to the ethoxy group. It was kicked off as OET minus the ethoxide anion. After this second round of addition, we end up with an alkoxide connected to a saturated or sp3 hybridized carbon. And so beta elimination is no longer possible. We've got three carbon groups linked to this alkoxide carbon. All that remains now is to protonate the alkoxide upon acidic workup. That proton transfer generates the neutral alcohol product in which two equivalents of phenyl anion have added to the ester, and we've eliminated ethoxide, leaving us with a tertiary alcohol containing two copies of the same group. Notice that the last two steps, steps three and four, amount to a nucleophilic addition process. And finally, one more thing I'll mention is that hydride sources, like lithium aluminum hydride, react very similarly, and we've seen this previously. Just replace pH minus with H minus, and you'll see identical reactivity in the reduction of esters with lithium aluminum hydride. We've talked about nitriles as a member of the carboxylic acid derivative class, and one thing to point out about the nitrile is that the CN pi bond is polarized toward nitrogen. This means that the carbon is partially positively charged and potentially electrophilic. We're not super used to seeing that carbon act as an electrophile. It does so in the hydrolysis of nitriles to form amides, and it can also act as an electrophile when we treat a nitrile with a strong nucleophile, a carbanionic nucleophile, like an organolithium or a Grignard reagent. The mechanism looks long-winded, but it's not as complicated as it sounds, so we'll go through it and then we'll break it down into stages. In the first step of the mechanism, the nucleophilic carbanion derived from the Grignard reagent or organolithium adds to the nitrile or cyanocarbon in an AD sub N elementary step. This gives an anionic intermediate in which nitrogen bears a negative charge and a double bond, and the 
carbanionic group has added to the carbon. So this looks like the conjugate base, for example, of an imine. And it's much more stable than the carbanion we started with, since negative charge has migrated from carbon to nitrogen. Upon acidic workup, we're going to protonate that nitrogen. And if we use strong enough acid and a large enough concentration of acid, we can protonate it twice. This gets us all the way from the conjugate base of an imine to the conjugate acid of an imine, an aminium ion. Essentially what we've done in the first two steps, the ADN and the first proton transfer to generate a neutral imine, is a nucleophilic addition process. The nucleophilic addition of, in this case, ethane to the cyano group. Everything that follows, steps three through seven, is a mechanism that we've seen before, acidic hydrolysis. This starts with protonation of the amine nitrogen to give an aminium ion, followed by the addition of water to the aminium ion to give a tetrahedral intermediate. And I'm gonna skip a few steps here, skip a few proton transfers to get us to the neutral tetrahedral intermediate. Proton transfer to the nitrogen sets up NH3 plus as a potential leaving group here, and then beta elimination kicks off NH3 as a leaving group. And we might use something like a large excess of water or heating the reaction mixture to drive off ammonia to push this reversible process forward. And the product of this step that we end up with is a protonated ketone. And of course, under conditions where we're using catalytic acid to do this, water will deprotonate this. This may happen in the course of the reaction or during workup to give the neutral ketone product. And ultimately, all we've done from the aminium ion to the ketone is just an acidic hydrolysis process in which oxygen substitutes for nitrogen. The cool thing about this reaction is that it can be used as part of a bigger strategy where we start with two alkyl halides, R1X and R2X, and we essentially bridge them with the carbonyl group to form the corresponding ketone, R1 linked to the carbonyl carbon and R2 linked to the carbonyl carbon. The way we do this is by using R1X as an electrophile in a substitution reaction with cyanide. CN minus plus the first alkyl halide forges this first nitrile structure. We can then take the second alkyl halide and treat it with magnesium to generate a Grignard reagent. And after addition of the Grignard reagent to the nitrile followed by acidic hydrolysis, we end up with this ketone product. So just to show that in detail, if we started with, say, the alkyl bromide here and treated with sodium cyanide, we would get to the nitrile intermediate that you see in the top left of the slide. And based on the general picture, this CH3OCH2 fragment is acting as the R1 group, we might say. We then treated with ethyl Grignard, which of course could be generated from ethyl bromide via treatment with magnesium. And here the ethyl group is serving in the role of R2. After this reaction followed by acidic hydrolysis, we end up with the ketone product in which we have R1 as one of the carbon groups linked to the carbonyl carbon and R2 as the other group linked to the carbonyl carbon. And the idea here is we went from two alkyl halides, R1Br and R2Br, to a carbonyl compound bridging the two R groups. Finally, I want to talk about an approach for synthesizing carboxylic acids from either organolithiums or Grignard reagents using carbon dioxide as an electrophile. Carbon dioxide is a really interesting molecule once you've learned about carbonyl chemistry because it looks like a double carbonyl compound two carbonyl groups sharing a central carbon. This makes the central carbon of CO2 a good electrophile. After all, it's being pulled on by not one, but two carbonyl oxygens, right? And so it is very willing and able to accept electrons from a strong enough nucleophile. And organolithiums and Grignard reagents are more than strong enough to add to the carbonyl carbon of carbon dioxide. The mechanism here is quite straightforward and highly analogous to the additions of carbonyls that we've already seen. The Grignard reagent, which I'm actually just going to write as R minus, leaving out the Mg plus Cl spectator, first adds to the carbonyl carbon or the central carbon of CO2. Here I'm representing that with a dot at the center of the structure. This addition process forms a carboxylate anion and Needless to say, the carboxylate is much, much more stable 
than the carbane ion we started with due to resonance delocalization and the negative charge living on oxygen. So this is a heavily favored and irreversible step. After this point, we have the carboxylate in the reaction mixture and to isolate the neutral carboxylic acid, we use acidic workup. So we simply add enough strong acid to protonate the carboxylate completely, generating the neutral carboxylic acid. This reaction can be a really nice way to turn an alkyl halide through two steps into a carboxylic acid. Imagine we started, for example, with RCl and treated that with magnesium metal. That would lead to the Grignard reagent shown here. We could then convert that Grignard reagent into the corresponding carboxylic acid just by treating with CO2 and acidic workup. And the great thing about this is that you can use solid CO2 to do this. You don't have to bubble gas through the reaction mixture. You can use dry ice to accomplish this very easily. This is another reaction that's commonly done in undergraduate organic chemistry labs. One last quick note, if you look back at the reactivity map of carboxylic acids and derivatives that we generated in an earlier video, you'll see this sequence in there, the treatment of an alkyl halide with magnesium followed by CO2 and aqueous workup to generate a carboxylic acid. So this is an entry into all those reactions of carboxylic acids and derivatives that we've already seen.